to be holy is to be exalted or worthy of complete devotion as one perfect in goodness and righteousness. To be holy is to be divine. Now, some in their self-righteousness, they foolishly believe themselves to already be perfect in goodness. They believe this in their own eyes. Considering how the self-righteous ones act, I find the notion that they believe themselves to already be perfect in goodness. I believe that to be a very foolish notion. See, everyone desires to be the best person they could possibly be. However, our idea for what is perfect, for what is perfect in goodness. In other words, our idea of what is holy, I tell you, our idea looks completely flawed. It is foolish. Many approach the idea of being perfect in goodness with the same approach that we saw the Babylonians had in my sermon last week. They believe that their power, the might that they have procured to be a sign of them being perfect in their way. The Babylonians, we saw that they said of themselves, I am, which is again a statement that we saw and know that the Lord made to Moses when he told Moses to say, I am sent me. To think in such a manner would be to equate one to the Lord. And we know again that God is perfect, that he is righteous. We know that God is, in other words, holy. Like I said last week, the self-righteous, they believe themselves to be God. However, the supposed godliness, the supposed holiness of the self-righteous, it is so far from the true beauty of holiness. So I want to close out this month of sermons where, again, I have focused on the self-righteous. I want to focus here today on the true beauty of holiness so that we can truly know what it is and know properly how to portray the holiness that resides in all of us who truly believe in the Lord. I feel I must ask you a question today, and that question is this. Do you desire to be holy? To the Ephesians, Paul wrote that, If we desire to truly be holy, we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And I ask you today, do you desire to be holy? The world, it deceives us with its ideas of what is holy and what is good. But if we truly desire to be holy, I tell you today that we must not fall for the trickery of the world. As we saw last week, deception, it is a very powerful enemy of ours as it has the power to blind us. It has the power to blind mankind from seeing the truth. As we know, the truth it is in Jesus Christ. So in order for one to walk in the beauty of holiness, we must stop being deceived and we must seek the truth ourselves. Now, I would tell you today that finding the truth, it is actually not a difficult task for anyone. Jesus, he told us very plainly that if we seek 
the Lord ourselves, if we seek the Lord, who again it is truth, he, God, will make himself available to us and the truth will be found. Over the past couple of weeks, we saw, we have seen that this definitely must be the case that the truth can be found in God and it is not difficult for us. As we saw Job, Abraham and Sarah, the only thing that they needed to do was slow themselves down. They need to slow themselves down. And then by slowing themselves down, they could put their hearts in the right place in order to find him in order for them to gain clarity, in order for them to gain understanding. In other words, in order for them to find truth. You see, what often happens to us is that we end up rushing ahead of God. And when we rush ahead of God, the only thing we end up doing is we make things difficult, not on God, but on ourselves all because we decided to get out ahead of God, who again is the beginning of knowledge. And because we get out ahead of him, the only thing we end up doing is make things difficult on ourselves by missing out on his knowledge, by missing out on his truth. You have heard me say it before, but I want you to understand that it takes a humble heart to find the Lord. In other words, it takes a humble heart to truly find the truth. You see, a prideful person, a self-righteous person will never find the Lord. Therefore, because they can never find God, I would tell you today, they can never know the truth. They can never know true holiness as they will proclaim themselves to be. So if we truly desire to be holy by seeking the truth from the Lord, we must first humble ourselves. In other words, I would tell you today, we must go about things maturely. We must be mature. Mm -hmm. To this point, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, do not be children in understanding, but in understanding, Paul said, be mature. So in order for one to truly become holy as God is holy, one must take a humble, one must take a mature approach. Now, what is fascinating about this point from Paul is that Though little children are immature, little children can actually be very mature at the same time. Now, someone may ask and somebody may wonder, well, what, how, how can you come to that point? Well, little children, they can be very mature when it comes to asking questions. You see, a little child, they will drive you absolutely crazy with the amount of questions that they can throw your way. Amen. I believe all of us know that very well. Amen. <laughs> I have a niece and a nephew. They could drive you absolutely crazy with the amount of questions that they asked when they were little children. You see, little children, they simply just want to know things. They want to know how things work. Little children, they have a ton of questions because they just want to have some kind of understanding, if you will. However, we also all know this very well ourselves that little children, they grow up just a little bit and they become teenagers, just as we did. And that teenager, which again is still a child, by the way, they suddenly know everything. They stop asking questions, don't they? Then we stop asking questions when we were a teenager. And they and we ourselves as a teenager, we ended up having to learn things the hard way. 
The world's doctrine would tell you that obtaining wealth and power, it equals godliness, therefore holiness. Mm -hmm. By this logic, one who is most greedy would be on track to becoming holy. This would also suggest that one who is filled with covetousness must also be on track to being holy. Therefore, those who seemingly have a lack of humility, who have a lack of empathy because of their greed and because of their covetousness, they must also be on track to becoming holy, according to the world. And there are many people in the world who go about foolishly with a teenage mindset, believing those things to actually be true. And they go about carrying themselves in that mindset. I tell you today that if these characteristics lead to holiness, I personally want nothing to do with the world's idea for holiness. I want nothing to do with it because nothing about greed, nothing about covetousness, nothing about a lack of compassion sounds like holiness. Nothing about it sounds beautiful to me. Again, I tell you today, there are many people who live by such a doctrine that believe that should they acquire the world, that they will be exalted by the world, that they will be praised because they have gained the world by such a manner. Many have bought into the notion that gaining the world will put them above all of their problems. Many believe that gaining the world will mean that they will have no struggles. Many believe that if they gain the world, they will be invincible. I again suggest to you today to not have the mindset of an immature teenager. Do not have the mindset of one who is still a child. The mindset of a teenage child, I will tell you today, it is most vulnerable to being tricked. It is most vulnerable to being fooled. It is most vulnerable to being deceived into making poor decisions. Sadly, the mind of the self-righteous, I tell you today, it is just as a teenage child that makes poor decisions, that refuses to listen, that refuses to gain any clarity or any understanding because they know everything. They refuse to listen to any truth. And I tell you today that if you desire to attain holiness, if you desire to walk in the beauty of holiness, you cannot be like an immature child and follow the counsel of fools. Do you hear me here today? So again, we must not be cared about by every wind of doctrine and by the trickery of men. True holiness, I want you to see and I want you to know that it is nothing like the messiness of the world's idea for what is perfect in goodness and righteousness. True holiness, I want you to see, I want you to know today that it again is absolutely beautiful. Now, in order for one to walk in the true beauty of holiness, we will see Paul tell us here in the fourth chapter of Ephesians and in the 30th and the 31st verse there, he tells us to not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Paul, he tells us that if we desire to walk in the beauty of holiness, he tells us to let all bitterness, to let all wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speech be put away from us with all malice, with all intent. 
So let us understand that holiness, first off, that is what all tr true believers should actually be striving to be. You today should be striving to be holy if you are truly a child of God. Now, thankfully, the Lord has shown us the way that we can become holy so that we do not have to do like those who are self-righteous. We don't have to do any kind of guesswork. Not only that, we don't have to exalt. We don't have to praise ourselves as being holy and righteous. We see here in our key verses for this week's message that Paul writes that in order for us to be holy, he writes that we must not walk as others who are deceived by the futility of their mind. Mm -hmm. Paul, you see, encourages us to walk in the renewed spirit of our mind. Mm -hmm. To do this, Paul tells us that we should put on the new man, which was created according to God, not created by anybody else, but created according to God in true righteousness and in true holiness. So because we, through our faith, are born of God, again, God is holy, we should walk not according to the world, we should walk in God's holiness. Again, you, the child of God, you should desire to be holy. Not only that, you should walk not according to the world, you should walk according to God's holiness. So let's be clear about this today. True righteousness and true holiness, it does not come by way of the world. It does not come by way of any actions of wickedness. As we have learned, as we have studied and know, true holiness and righteousness can only come from the Lord because God is the one who is holy and righteous. This is just as Jesus taught us when he stated that a good tree, that is a righteous tree, cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree, that is a corrupt tree, bear good fruit. Therefore, the world, it cannot bring forth holiness. Therefore, the world, it cannot bring forth righteousness because it, the world, it is not holy nor is the world righteous. So how can anyone who lives according to the world ever believe themselves to be holy and righteous? Compared to those who walk in the ugliness of self-righteousness, Polly tells us that if we desire to walk in the beauty of holiness, we see him tell us in the 25th verse there that we need to put away that old lying tongue of ours. As we saw a couple of weeks ago in his letter, James, he stated that the tongue can defile. He said that the tongue, it can corrupt the whole body. Not only that, James said that the tongue, it has the power to set fire the course of nature. The one that desires to be holy, I tell you today, needs to get rid of that lying tongue because that lying tongue it is very destructive in his power. In his letter to the Colossians, Paul, he, he wrote and he told us, do not lie to one another. Since you have put off 
the old man, the one that isn't holy or righteous, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge and according to the image of God who created you, you ought not lie to one another. Again, the lying tongue, let us think about this for a second here. The lying tongue, what does it do? It stirs up nothing but a bunch of mess. The lying tongue, it it stirs up a bunch of strife. It it stirs up a bunch of contention. That old lying tongue of ours, it stirs up a bunch of confusion. One that lives in a manner that would promote the lies of a lying tongue, I would suggest and tell you today it is promoting a work of deception. A work of deception that leads to destruction. What sounds holy about that? Of this one, Solomon called the liar a wicked person. Solomon said the wicked man does deceptive work, but he who sows righteousness will have a sure reward. As righteousness leads to life, so he who pursues evil pursues it to his own death. I tell you today that the tongue of one that is holy and righteous should not promote destruction. The tongue of one who is holy and righteous should not be promoting death. The tongue of one who is holy and righteous should be promoting life. Mm -hmm. Again, in the book of Proverbs, Solomon wrote, the mouth of the righteous is a well of life, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. If you are holy and righteous, what are you doing with a mouth that is of the wicked? Think about that for a moment. How could anyone ever consider themselves to be holy when they do nothing but bring harm and destruction upon others? You see, the way of one who is truly walking in the beauty of holiness, it's not a way of destruction. It is a way of hope. It is a way of uplifting as it uplifts others by the words of truth, by the words of God. So if you are walking in the beauty of holiness, you yourself ought to be a bringer of hope and not destruction. Do you hear me here today? We'll see that Paul, he focused on this thought of hope given through the beauty of holiness to the Ephesians here in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. Compared to those who walk in the ugliness of self-righteousness, the one that walks in the beauty of holiness, we will see Paul tell us there in the 29th verse, they should let no corrupt word proceed out of their mouths. Look at that. If you desire to walk in the beauty of holiness, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. No corrupt word belongs on your tongue if you desire to walk in the beauty of holiness. My God. You see, we have to remember that the Holy Spirit dwells in all who have accepted Christ in their heart. Through this inner dwelling, the Holy Spirit is transforming us from that old unrighteous person to one who is a new person. That old unrighteous person is one who is unable to give others hope because hope does not reside in them. That old unrighteous person does not have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. Whereas the new person that the Holy Spirit dwells in, that new person is being transformed into one that is holy and righteous. So the spirit of one that the Holy Spirit is dwelling in 
should be a spirit that brings forth good fruit. That should be a spirit that is bringing forth hope to all of those that are around them. In other words, the one in whom the Holy Spirit dwells in should be one that brings life to all of those that are around them. Are you bringing life to those that are around you today? Are you walking in the beauty of holiness? The words that pour out of the mouth of the believer, I tell you today, should certainly not be deceiving lies. Nor should they be corrupt words that will poison the hearts of others. The words that come from the heart and the mouths of believers should be words that are good for necessary edification. These are encouraging words that Paul tells us again in the 29th verse there that will impart grace to those who hear them. Let us, let us consider and think of the Lord for a moment here. Let us consider the manner that the Lord deals with all of us today. When the Lord speaks to you, are they not words of encouragement? I tell you today that when God speaks to me, there are always words of encouragement. There are always words of hope. The words of God, they, they give me life. The words that I hear from God, they are words uh, that, that heals me in my soul. The words that, that come from God, I tell you today, there are words that, that comfort me when I am in need of comforting. The words that I hear from God, I would tell you today, they are words that uplift me in those times when I have hit rock bottom and I am in need of uplifting. And so again, I would ask you today, are the words from God not words that heal us in those times when we are in need of healing? Do the words of God not comfort us in those times when we are in need of comforting? Does the words of God not uplift us in those times when we have hit rock bottom ourselves and are in need of being lifted back up on our feet? Well. Yes, there may be times when the words of God may seem to be harsh to us. But I again tell you today that God, he speaks to us from a place of unconditional love. From this place of love and compassion, God always encourages us. And his words, I tell you today, they give us hope. They give us life rather than tear us down, rather than beat us down to death. Why should we, if we desire to walk in the beauty of holiness, why should we ever tear someone down and bring them so low down to the ground to the point of death? Holiness, I want you to understand today, in its beauty, it breathes hope. It breathes life into those that stand in witness of its beauty. Do you hear me here? I ask you today. Again, I ask you today, do you desire to walk in the beauty of holiness? Will you put away that lying tongue? Will you put away any corrupt words that may come from your own mouth to walk in the beauty of holiness today? Compared to those who walk in the ugliness of self-righteousness, the believer will see Paul say there in the 26th and in the 27th verse there in the fourth chapter, should not move out of anger and should not move out of wrath. Paul, he says, be angry and do not sin. He says there, do not give place to the devil. How can one who is holy give place to the devil? Think about that for a moment. How can the devil live in one 
who is truly righteous and holy, who is truly walking in the beauty of holiness. You see, Paul, he was a man that understood very well that all people, including himself, whether they were a believer or not, can be moved to anger and not only moved to anger, but also act out of anger. Even God, we see, can be provoked due to those that oppose him and his people. Yet when God moves, he moves justly. The Lord, he moves and act out of righteousness. Again, his judgment is just and his righteousness, it is righteous. There's nobody that can tell the Lord otherwise. On the other hand, when we move, especially when we move out of anger, we move wildly. We move irrationally. We move blindly. We move in a way that leads to more and more sin. We move in a way that does nothing but bring harm to others. So Paul, he speaks to the idea that we need to learn how to put such anger in control. In other words, we need to learn self-control if we truly desire to walk in the beauty of holiness. If we who desire to walk in the beauty of holiness, if we truly desire it, we must learn how to control our temper. We must learn how to not act out of anger. We must learn how to not act irrationally. Again, we must learn how to not act wildly. One that walks in the beauty of holiness, they cannot lash out in anger. They cannot lash out in wrath as neither action can produce holiness or righteousness. Again, Paul quoted something that we see from the Old Testament scripture, where Paul, he said in the 12th chapter of Romans, in the 17th verse, repay no evil with evil. He continued on and said, have regard for good things in the sight of not some men, but all men, all people. The one that is holy should give place to wrath for vengeance is the Lord and he, God, will repay it. We don't have to worry about acting out of anger and acting out of wrath, trying to have and take on vengeance ourselves. The one that desires to be holy should be slow to anger, should be slow to wrath. The one that desires to walk in the beauty of holiness should be patient and hard. See, those that are patient and hard will bring about not calamity, but will bring about peace. They will bring about calm as well. So the end result of true holiness, again, it is just that. A bringer of peace, a bringer of calm. As true believers, we should always be seeking to bring peace and calm to others, walking in the beauty of holiness. As Paul encouraged the believers in Rome, I would encourage all of you today with one of my favorite verses that we will find in the Bible. We who desire to walk in the beauty of holiness, if it is possible, as much as it depends on us, we should live peaceably with all people. Did you hear that today? In the 12th chapter of Romans, you look down there at that 18th and the 19th verse, you will see that, that Paul touched on this, that if it's possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably, not with some people, not with just those that you like, but with all people. This is the way of the Lord. He desires for there to be peace. 
He, de he desires for all of us to live in that peace, not by ourselves, but with one another. Self-righteousness, I want you to understand, it is an evil plague that is spread through our society and all around the world. Instead of peace, instead of calm, it has brought about great harm to many people. The reason being is because the self-righteous ones believe themselves to be perfect when they are not. And then they try to dictate their ways on to others, believing that their way is holy and righteous. In other words, believing that their way is good and right. They see themselves as being holy and righteous as if they are gods, but they are not holy and righteous. They are not perfect. They are not gods. This, we know, leads them to trying to, again, dictate their ways on to others in truth. They are not what they think they are. In fact, their failures are doing nothing to uplift anyone but themselves as they glorify themselves, as they exalt themselves. In fact, their failures, it is doing nothing to uplift anyone as the only thing they may have managed to do is tear others down and to destroy them. God does not desire for anyone to care themselves in such a manner. Yes, the Lord wants you to walk in the beauty of holiness, but he does not want you to walk in the own, the holiness that you have made up and that you have created for yourself. God desires for you to walk in his beauty and in his holiness. That is what we should walk in. Through the prophet Isaiah, it is said, the lofty looks of man will be humbled. The haughtiness of men will be bowed down. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it that is lifted up shall be brought low. One day, the false image of godliness, the false image of holiness, the false image of righteousness will be torn down, not by man's hands, but by the Lord. It will not stand. In that day, the ones who are truly holy and righteous, they will stand. And I tell you, they will stand with the Lord. If you walk in the beauty of holiness in this world, you are going to walk in the holiness of God for all of eternity. Do you hear that there today? Amen. However, as I referenced in last week's message, Christ said that the Lord will exalt those that humble themselves, not those who exalt themselves. Let us remember, it is the humble heart that leads us to truly becoming holy. As we have seen today, those that humble themselves open themselves up to walking truly in the beauty of God's holiness. Because we are able to submit ourselves to the way of truth. We are able to submit ourselves to the Lord, our God, who again is holiness. So therefore, we are able to submit ourselves to true holiness. Mm -hmm. Those that walk in the beauty of holiness, they walk in a manner to where they serve others rather than serving themselves, boasting about their own ego and their own pride, their own accomplishments. For this, the holy ones will be exalted, not by man, but by God. And I tell you today that this is the highest of exaltations. This is the highest of praises. I make this statement to you today because I know that all people try to live their lives doing what they believe is right and good. But that's a bunch of guesswork 
if you're doing it without God. Yes, we desire to be the best person that we could possibly be. And if we do desire that, then we ourselves, we should turn to God. God, I want you to understand, he takes that guesswork away from us. We don't have to guess what is good and right. We don't have to guess what is holy and what is righteous. God, he desires for us to grow. He desires for us to improve ourselves. He desires for us to simply do this by following his lead, by following his example. That's all we have to do if we truly desire to walk in the beauty of holiness. When we follow his lead, we will truly walk in the beauty of holiness. And I tell you today that it will be a beautiful sight for all to see. Amen. Amen. Amen.